Section 26 of The Wars of the Roses by Robert Balmain Mowat. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 19 The Last of the Lancastrians, Part 1. Queen Margaret and her son did not follow the successful expedition. Throughout the brief period of Lancastrian restoration, October 1470, to april fourteen seventy one they remained in france mainly as it seems at the court of louis the eleventh undoubtedly this was a mistake as the presence of the young prince edward of wales would have done something to rouse the sentiment for the lancastrian family which the appearance of the now apathetic king henry failed to evoke queen margaret had not seen her husband since she left him in bamborough castle in august 1463. It is strange that she did not now take the opportunity afforded by his restoration to come over to England and see him. Poor Henry himself sent to France for his wife and son in February 1471, but still they did not come. If Margaret was waiting for Warwick to establish the Lancastrian government on a firm basis, she was waiting in vain boldness and confidence were essential to the safety of the restored dynasty the absence of queen and prince showed how much that essential boldness and confidence were lacking it may be that margaret as a frenchwoman did not understand the english nation the new government did what it could to get the machinery of administration into working order warwick had the position of lieutenant of the kingdom new money was struck with the head of Henry on one side and an image of St. Michael on the other. These coins were called angels. A parliament was summoned to meet on November 26th. The new government showed itself merciful, seeing that everybody quietly accepted the new regime. Only the constable of England was executed. John Tiptoft, Earl of Worcester, that horrid butcher and savage beheader of men, he had been captured hiding near Weybridge, knowing that he could expect no mercy. His death took place on October 18, 1470. On November 26, Parliament met. Archbishop Neville, Warwick's brother, was again Chancellor, and preaching the opening sermon from the text, Turn, O Backsliding Children. In the event of the House of Lancaster becoming extinct, the reversion of the crown was settled upon Clarence. The attainders formerly passed against Henry's supporters were reversed, and thus prominent exiles like the Duke of Somerset were able to come back to England. The Parliament sat till Christmas. So ended the year 1470. Nothing seems to have happened to disturb the peace of the new government until March 1471. Early in that month, it became known that king edward was likely at any moment to make a descent upon the east coast since his hurried exit from england on october third fourteen seventy edward had been vigorously preparing for his return at first things had not gone well for him the duke of burgundy who was at boulogne when he first heard of edward's disaster it was reported as the king's death received the news with equanimity for his personal tastes lay more towards Lancaster than York. When he heard that Edward was alive and in Flanders, he was little troubled. He sent Philippe de Comines to Calais to inquire after the disposition of the garrison there. De Comines reported that on receiving the news of Edward's flight from England, within a quarter of an hour, the whole town had assumed the ragged staff, the livery of the Earl of Warwick. So great was the instability of human affairs worse was to follow for de comines learned that warwick according to the terms of his alliance with louis the eleventh intended to send four thousand men over to calais to make war on burgundy from this however he was dissuaded by the remonstrances of the merchants of the staple who feared to lose the great market for their wool which was in flanders edward did not meet duke charles till the beginning of fourteen seventy one in the meantime he must have relied chiefly on the hospitality of the seigneur de la Rouse. when fortune later smiled on him edward was able handsomely to repay this kindness 
but in january fourteen seventy one two meetings were arranged between edward and charles the important conference was at st paul on january seventh charles who feared the consequences for his duchy of the union of the earl of warwick and louis the eleventh against him was loath to give open support to the yorkist cause but at last while publicly pretending to give no assistance and issuing a proclamation against any of his subjects taking part he agreed to lend edward fifty thousand florins and three or four great ships of his own besides hiring a number of hanseatic ships well armed to convey edward's force to england next month february edward seems to have passed at bruges where he was well received by the flemish nobility and greatly helped in his plans for invading england on march second his force embarked at flushing he had in all twelve hundred men mainly english but partly flemish auxiliaries chief among his followers were his brother richard duke of gloucester his brother-in-law antony earl rivers and his chamberlain lord hastings contrary winds prevented the ships making the passage to england until march eleventh during all this time edward kept the men on board ship ready to sail but on the eleventh the expedition sailed for the coast of norfolk arriving off cromer on tuesday march twelfth finding through inquiries made by some of his men on shore that the people of east anglia favoured the earl of warwick edward sailed further north and in spite of a severe tempest landed on the fourteenth of march in the shelter of spurnhead near the site of the little port of ravenspur ever since henry of bolingbroke landed there in thirteen ninety nine the sea had been gradually encroaching and by fourteen seventy one there was probably little of ravenspur left to-day it has disappeared on the next day edward having collected his men for they had not all landed at the same spot pushed forward to york proclaiming like another henry of bolingbroke that he only came to claim his inheritance as duke of york so they proceeded in a north-easterly direction by hull and beverley without opposition to york the capital of the north march eighteenth here king edward and his host were refused admittance but on the king consenting to bring only fifteen men at arms leaving the rest of his force outside it was agreed to admit him the citizens seem by no means to have all favoured his party edward however whose courage was of the highest did not fear to enter almost alone he was greeted by a multitude of citizens crying long live king henry but on edward's appealing to them as duke of york they responded to him by crying at last long live the noble duke of york his confidence and courage were rewarded even the rest of his forces were now admitted to receive much needed refreshment and rest on condition that they should depart next morning next morning king edward and his men avoiding all chance of a riot with the citizens left york and took the road for tadcaster from there he followed the more westerly road to wakefield so avoiding pontefract which was held by warwick's brother the marquis montague that edward was able to march so far unopposed was largely due to the fact that the safeguarding of the north for king henry was entrusted to two different men to warwick's brother the marquis montague formerly earl of northumberland and to henry percy whom in fourteen seventy edward had restored to the earldom of northumberland when he deprived montague of it between montague and percy there could be no cordiality percy purposely did not oppose edward's march and so rendered him great service montague alone was too weak to oppose the king from wakefield which was part of the domain of the duke of york edward advanced to doncaster and to nottingham at nottingham he is said to have received his first considerable accession six hundred well-armed men under two local knights here too he received his first definite news of the plans of his enemy his spies informed him that the duke of exeter and the earl of oxford were behind him at newark eighteen miles northeast of nottingham with four thousand men of east anglia but edward had no need to turn back to deal with them when they heard that he was likely to come they hastily evacuated newark edward on learning that the men of east anglia were no longer dangerous 
he immediately continued his advance hoping to have a decisive conflict with the earl of warwick who had left london and come into warwickshire there to gather all his men for dealing with the invader edward marched through leicestershire where he received an accession of three thousand men warwick avoiding a battle retired into coventry with about seven thousand men edward arrived in front of the town on march thirtieth his forces are said to have been slightly inferior to those of warwick nevertheless the earl refused his offer of battle and kept within the walls it is possible that he was waiting for reinforcements to come from his brother montague from the east anglian men under the duke of exeter and perhaps also from the duke of clarence nevertheless his refusal to meet king edward's army was a mistake for the king leaving coventry behind went on at once and occupied the town of warwick thus he lay between the earl's forces and london the balance of power at this moment lay with clarence who had four thousand men raised in gloucestershire and wiltshire the duke had soon sickened of his position in the restored lancastrian court warwick's acknowledgment of king henry and prince edward of wales cut him off more than ever from the crown the old lancastrian nobles did not conceal their contempt for him while edward was in flanders great efforts had been made by his sister the duchess of burgundy through various messengers to reconcile the two brothers clarence soon made up his mind to support edward again and to use his levies in his brother's service while edward was at the town of warwick he heard that clarence was coming to him some inkling of this may account for the earl of warwick's hesitation in coventry but the earl would have been well advised to attack the king separately before the approach of clarence for edward when he heard of clarence's approach at once set out and met his brother at banbury thence the united forces returned to the town of warwick some feudal negotiations took place with the earl in coventry these failed and edward again offered battle under the walls of that town on april fifth but again failing to draw the earl he resolved to go straight on to london from which he must have had good intelligence that the citizens would receive him without difficulty on palm sunday april seventh he attended service in the great church at daventry and is said to have received an intimation from st anne that his campaign would be successful from daventry edward went on to dunstable and was able to send comfortable news to his queen who since his departure for flanders had been in sanctuary at westminster thence he pushed forward to london and entered the city on april eleventh he was loyally received by the mayor aldermen and burgesses and by the archbishop of york warwick's brother who seeing the hopelessness of attempting to hold london had made terms with king edward End of section twenty six